Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. So the days have been getting shorter, and definitely there's a bit of a chill in the air that we hadn't been experiencing the last couple months. And we know that means harvest season. And when you look around Ohio, we've seen a lot of combines roll in here over the last week to week and a half. So we've got Aaron Wilson with us here today, because once those combines start rolling, we all wonder, you know, what's it going to look like? How quickly can we get through harvest? So thanks for joining us, Aaron. We're really excited to hear what you see coming here over the next couple months. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. It's always a blast to join you and Amanda. So as usual, when we bring you on, we want you to give us a recap of what we've seen. So could you give us a summary of what the growing season that we just experienced looked like? Yeah, absolutely. So funny enough, if we look at the growing season, and let's say let's define it April 15th through September 15th, uh, it was a fairly average growing season here in Ohio. Uh, temperatures were close to average, at least uh, you know from a temperature perspective, it was close to average. Uh, overall, for the growing season, we had areas of Ohio that picked up uh, you know, certainly a, a good amount of rain, if you're thinking about the southern counties and eastern Ohio. Uh, but from central Ohio, westward toward the Miami Valley region, and then northwest Ohio, north central Ohio, those areas you know, turned out to be fairly dry over the, over the full uh, span there from April to September. Of course, we know that there's a lot of uh, individual months within that period and individual weather events that help define that season. Uh, but from a, a larger scope, a larger picture, we can say that the season was fairly average. So what about the details within this past growing season do you think are really important for us to consider? Yeah, so certainly, you know, instead of looking at it from the whole April to, to September perspective, if we break that down a little bit, you know, there was a lot of interesting things throughout the season. We had uh, our 11th warmest March on record, which if, if you recall, uh, we had soil temperatures that warmed up quite nicely during the month of March. And as, and as a matter of fact, when we got into April, we had some soil temperatures hovering around 55 to 60 degrees. We had a very chilly April, which drove those soil temperatures down back into the 30s and 40s across the state. And they were really, you know, it took quite a while then throughout the month of May, which was also cooler than average, uh, to get those soil temperatures back up to where we we really wanted them for planting season. Overall, spring was a wet season. We we had a fairly wet season in the spring, uh, primarily in April and May that that were wet. So for some of us that posed, you know, a little bit later planting uh, combined with those cooler soils. But Pretty much as we got to the end, end of May, you know, things were rolling nicely. We were finally turning that corner and things were drying out a bit. Now, June did bring on quite a bit of dry weather for northwest Ohio, north central Ohio, um, that once we got to July, which was our sixth warmest July on record going back to 1895, that really started to dry those soils out very rapidly. And, and we saw some areas of drought pick up. Uh, particularly along that Bell Fountain Ridge area from Hardin down through Champaign County, uh, up in the Northwest, Williams, Defiance, Paulding, uh, and Van Wert counties really saw the drought and then expanding drought conditions from say, Richland, Ashland through Wayne and Stark counties. Because of that very hot July, soils were already primed to be dry and that just made things a lot worse. We had some regional improvements in August that helped out a little bit in some areas, especially South and East. East Central Ohio, say Coshocton, Licking County, uh, Fairfield County seemed to fare pretty well this year, especially up uh, in Northeast, say Cuyahoga County, uh, Lorraine, those areas seemed to be okay, but other places really struggled. And I think it showed that in the crop stress in August. You know, the heat and, and dryness taking a little bit off the corn, I think in July, the heat and lack of rainfall maybe taking a little bit off the yields and in, in beans in, in August. Uh, we'll have to see as those yields start coming in. Uh, and then we had our, our Labor Day rainfall, which brought a lot of rainfall across northern Ohio, uh, three to six inches of rainfall in many areas, which kind of too late for a lot of the crops, but certainly helps uh, with, the, um, with the soil and, and, and the, the soil recharge and soil moisture. So now that it's dry, of course, a lot of farmers want to keep it that way to get the, get the harvest in. And certainly the last couple of weeks, the end of September, really played out really well to dry things down pretty quickly, I think, across the state. Yeah, just a comment on the differences across Ohio. I think 
with the impact of COVID and not being able to get around a lot this year, I was, I'm in, you know, that Madison Champaign area and we're still dry. So to hear people, when I talked to friends across the state and they were expecting bumper crops in some areas, I was like, are you really? I mean, because we were not. So that definitely a lot of variation across the state. Yeah. And in and, and that Madison Champaign and then even extending down into Pickaway County, you know, it sounds kind of very, there's big differences for, for instance, between Pickaway and Ross County you know, just, just in that, that regard, there's big differences out West between dark County and Preble County, just one County apart, just based on the amount of moisture they've received. So it has been tricky for, for a lot of you while others have, you know, a little bit more on the have side of things. Yeah. We've also been a little dry down here and we've seen that really play out in our double crop beans, which is going to lead into the next question. We wouldn't mind a little bit more rain on those. Um, even if it does slow down harvest a little bit, but we're starting to worry about frost. You know, we had a couple mornings here last week where, you know, it was, it was a little frosty, luckily not a killing frost, but what do you see over the next few weeks as the potential for, for what would end up being, I think, a pretty short season with as cold as we started out? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a very good, you know, what, what we saw over the, the latter part of September was uh, really dominance by high pressure, Canadian high pressure. Um, and, and that basically means clear skies during the day, clear skies at night, calm winds in general. And with soils being really dry, uh, one thing that dry soils do is it obviously it leads to less humidity in the atmosphere close to the surface. And with that lack of humidity close to the surface, dry air does two things it warms up very rapidly in the morning. So we can start out at 40 degrees and we're in the mid sixties two hours later because it's just, it's, it, it warms up the air a lot faster um, when it's dry versus when there's humidity there and it's and moisture and it's really going into evaporating that moisture from the surface, which we know temperatures don't increase during that evaporative phase because it's going in changing the liquid to a gas for instance it's kind of the basic physics there but then at nighttime what happens is you don't have that moisture close to the ground uh, that moisture then that typically would limit the overnight cooling because it also traps and, and absorbs the heat from the surface and radiate, radiates it back toward the surface without that humidity there all that energy escapes very efficiently to space and those temperatures in the evening you know what we felt over the last couple of weeks they, uh, they drop fairly quickly. It could go from a nice 4, 4.30, 5 o'clock afternoon temperature, and you need your sweat, sweater or sweatshirt by 7, 7.30 just because of that quick drop in temperature. So that's what we've seen. And so with dry air and the Canadian high pressure and control, you know, we had a couple opportunities for frost. Uh, we're now immersed in, in a much cooler pattern again after a slight warm-up last week. Um, and, and we're likely to see, you know, some frost uh, e even now, you know, over the next few days here as we start the month of October. And as we head in through the first week or two of October, temperatures look to, to remain fairly below average. Uh, you know, we should still be in the low to mid 70s for highs with overnight lows really in the low to mid 50s. And we're looking to be about 10 degrees colder than that, I think, throughout much of the uh, first couple of weeks of October here. October is also shaping up to be pretty dry. Um, you know, you mentioned your double crop beans. I don't think there's a lot of opportunity for, for rainfall, uh, at least not any heavy rainfall. Uh, we do have to keep in mind October is a dry month. Uh, we have two dry months in Ohio, October and February uh, that are on the drier side. Uh, so even a half inch to three quarters of an inch is about normal. And that's kind of what I see now, you know, on a weekly basis, maybe a half inch to three quarters of an inch each week here as we head through October, but some, you know, some areas could, could remain a little bit on the drier side of that. So I would hedge toward drier than average conditions, but not dry the entire month. Yeah, I've really been enjoying this weather. What do you think the difference has been? Because we had a dry growing season somewhat last year too. So what is it that high pressure that we didn't have that kept us warm so long into last year? Yeah, so we, we we had the drier conditions out there, but it's not just about the soil. Like you like you mentioned, last year was a lot of southerly breezes, and of course that's still going to bring up the warmer air, more humid air from the south. If you've noticed, you know we've had a lot of tropical activity this season, 
Um, we've had a few bouts of tropical activity here in Ohio. We had Tropical Storm Bertha in May. We had a derecho from Tropical Storm Cristobal come through in June. We had Hurricane Laura come through in August, which grazed the southern part of, of the, the, uh, the state. Um, and then we were worried about beta. You know, beta made landfall toward the end of September, almost 20 inches of rainfall in Houston. We were thinking it was going to bring up some moisture, but we really stayed north of this stationary or cold front dominated by that high pressure. And you notice we had a lot of easterly winds for a lar long time at the end of September. And, and with those northern, northeasterly and easterly winds, it's good, you know, it's just going to keep that dry air in place and not allow that warmer, moister air to move up like we had last fall. So that's why there's a little bit of difference, even though both seasons we saw some moderate drought conditions across Ohio in the months of August, September, and October. So let's jump to the, the question that probably most of our listeners are wanting to hear. What do you see in store for the rest of our harvest season? Yeah, so overall, I think harvest season will be pretty efficient. I, I don't, I don't, you know, from a weather perspective, precipitation perspective, again, I'm hedging more on the normal to slightly lower than average rainfall. So that speaks well to, you know, being able to efficiently get crops out of the field, uh, get wheat and other things hard, uh, planted for the season. I, I really don't see, uh, now there's a, a, some caveats to that. We still are immersed in this blistering speed in terms of the amount of hurricane and tropical storm activity that we've had. Um, and we could talk about why that is, you know, or at least one of the factors for that. But any one of these systems, you know, that, that's able to bring up some moisture into Ohio could be a fly in the ointment. But right now, we're just not predicting that that's the case, right? It looks like October is going to remain uh, close to average or slightly drier than average. And that speaks really well uh, to, to harvest. I'd be concerned perhaps with the dryness, you know, being just cautious about fire and fire potential perhaps. Um, but other than that, I think, you know, uh, this may be one of the easiest, uh, maybe I don't want to jinx this just yet. Uh, it's, it's shaping up to be a little bit better than what folks have had to deal with over the majority of the last 10 years. Well, and you mentioned fire hazards and, uh, you know, when we were getting ready for farm science review, we actually had, um, a few miles worth of little fires along 70. So it's, it's just, I, we hardly ever have that dry of conditions in Ohio that we have to worry about that. Um, have you been following um, the predictions for color change and what's expected for fall color this year? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a little bit and you know, a, a lot of that is driven by daylight, right? The amount of daylight we have that really initiates that change um, that, that our trees have. Uh, but what's interesting is there is some good weather for production of good color. And basically, we've been seeing a perfect prescription for fantastic color, which is warm, dry days with cool, crisp nights. And, and so that, you know, nice sunny days during the day, cool, crisp nights, can really help bring out some of those really good pigments that we like to see, the reds, the oranges, um, more so than in other years where, you know, it could be pretty damp and things just kind of change, muted colors drop and that's it. So um, if we get a hard freeze though, you know, that could limit the duration, right? Because then, then we start thinking about, uh, they basically freeze off the trees and they fall rapidly. But with these warm days, and cool, crisp nights, that's the perfect recipe for some really good color across Ohio. That's exciting to hear because I'm really looking forward to maybe getting out and doing some hiking here over the next couple weeks. And I agree. Colors always make it more enjoyable. So then moving into one of our other favorite subjects, which is winter recreation. Any way too early predictions on what we could see this winter? We've Absolutely. We've got a cross for snow. Me too. I love the snow. Absolutely. So, um, you know, one of the patterns that has established itself over the last month or two and is likely to carry through the northern hemisphere winter is what we call La Nina conditions. Uh, La Nina just describes the sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific. They're cooler than average. Uh, and that has an impact on the weather here in the United States and in Ohio in a couple of ways. One, La Nina conditions often lead to conducive tropical activity in the Atlantic. So one of the factors driving this really uh, fast paced and a lot of storms, you know, we ran out of 
our, our, our names, our traditional names. Um, so now we're using the Greek alphabet for our tropical systems this year, which has only happened one other year in 2005. That was Hurricane Katrina year. Uh, but we're also about a month ahead of schedule. So we had beta about a month ahead of what we had in 2005. So that's conducive to that. So again, you know, we may catch some moisture from that over the next couple months, but it's too hard to predict exactly when that might happen. The other thing is La Nina really impacts Ohio and Ohio Valley winters, often bringing uh, a greater chance of precipitation, more, more moisture in the atmosphere, an active jet stream. The key to what's going to happen this winter will come down to how much of that cold air do we see. We've become more accustomed or intimate with the term polar vortex events. Uh, certainly they have the opportunity to bring down some really cold air and they typically happen when that polar jet stream around the Arctic is relaxed. It's uh, what we call a negative Arctic oscillation. It's just a, a that jet stream isn't so bound up in the Arctic and it, it relaxes a little bit and allows pulses of impulses of cold air to come down across the continental U.S. If we team up one of those cold air outbreaks with an active jet bringing a lot of moisture, that's the perfect recipe for some big snowstorms. That's what I'm crossing my fingers for. Sometimes, however, what we see is it warms up, it rains, cold front goes through, and it's cold. And then it warms up, it rains, the cold front goes through, and it's cold. And I'm, I'm really hoping that that's not the case. Now, in Ohio, you know, especially for those, the three of us that live in central, southwest, west central Ohio, you know, 20 to 30 inches is usually about all we can ask for. Um, you know, we were about 60 inches below average for the lake effect last year. Uh, if we get a little bit more of those northerly breezes, I think with a warm lake, freeze, will, freeze over will be a little bit later. So our northeastern counties could pick up some heavy heavy snow, uh, you know, over the next couple of months here through the months of uh, November, December in particular. So that's what we're, we're, what we're looking at. I do expect then this dryness once again that we're experiencing, by the time we get to planting season, we'll have recovered, soil moisture will be back. Um, and we could then be heading into spring again with saturated soils that sometimes just take a little bit longer to warm up. Yeah, that seems to be a common trend we're starting to see. So it's um, we'll have to touch base with you in another month or two and see if you have a better prediction on what our spring planting conditions will be. Absolutely. So you and Ben Brown are doing another grain and weather outlook program tomorrow, actually. We can put the link in there if it won't be too late to register. No, it won't be. Yeah. Okay. Great. So if you guys are looking for more information, um, Ben and Aaron do a nice job of kind of hitting the highlights of what really impacts the grain market, I think. Appreciate that, Amanda. I don't know if it was the last time you were on or time before that, we did the um, Wives Tales podcast. And a lot of those were centered around predicting fall and winter weather. So we need to keep an eye out for some of those, huh? Yeah, I think so. You know, it's always fun this time of year, start looking out for those woolly bears um, and, and see what those, that banding looks like and whether there's a lot of black banding could, could portend, right? Uh, a snowier or, or a harsh winter. I like to keep my eyes on those squirrels nest, you know, where they're, where they're located in, in, the, in the trees. Uh, hopefully you all counted up your August fogs uh, in, in August foggy mornings that, you know, according to the old wives tale will tell us how many snows we can expect. Uh, but certainly these are fun things to think about as we head through the, the fall season here and, and get ready for that. Hopefully uh, snowy winter that we have to look forward to. I'll be keeping my eye out for those woolly bears, Aaron. And thanks again for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Let me know what you find out there. Thanks for listening to the agronomy and farm management podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.